feel like uh, Julian that I'm uh, um, on a late night television show and saying that this guy doesn't need any introduction. Um, and certainly you don't. But Julie and I have been friends for a long time, and, and obviously Mike as well. Um, back to the, the first days of uh, his getting into premium financing, or starting this premium financing. And uh, as I've said to Julian many times and to other people, this industry would not exist if not for uh, Julian and putting his hands to take off with. So um, it has become uh, a large part of our industry in the insurance world. You know. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers and talked about 10,000 hours is what you need to have in order to be an expert. And I think I'm looking at a couple hundred thousand hours. I'm looking at Mike and Phil in there and the experts, expertise that they have in this industry. Um, some of you might have heard Julian and I talking. We were talking at the end of last year and he was aiming to get 180 cases done, which would have been his biggest year ever. Came in at 172, so a staggering big number over $400 million of target premium. So, um, you know, I think I can say, and everyone who's on this, who knows anything about what these guys have created, what Julian's done with this, you're not going to find any better rates out there than they have, any better programs. Uh, Julian stays involved with all the clients all the way through, you know, now almost 20 years into this. Still has clients on the books with these things. I'm out. Can, can people mute themselves, please? Because yeah, they have yeah. their speakerphones on. And Mike, you might be able to mute everybody, but um, yeah, but please do. But um, so, you know, for everyone out there, these are the two guys. These are the, 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 the best experts we have in this business. Um, there's no greater opportunity than right now to ask these guys questions and talk to them. There's a chat box down here on everyone's screen. If you have questions, it's going to be very interactive. As long as you guys have questions for them, they're going to answer them as they go along. Um, but with that, Julian, Mike, you know, the floor is all yours. And yeah. thank you. Thank you, very, thank you, Barry, for having us. And again, I know we go back over our relationship over 20 years. And again, our first case that we landed in premium finance in the life industry, it was in 1995. Now we are 27 years later, we're still going very strong. And, and again, I remember in 08, Barry, <clears throat> when we had the financial crisis, everybody thought that premium finance was dead. Keep in mind that our firm, and we're very proud of it, our firm was we were the only firm in the industry that back then in 08, we didn't use all our clients. You know? And that's one of the reasons today, carriers, they partner up with us, they have brochures co-branded with their names and our names together. So we're very proud of what we've done. Mike is my partner here, and he is my successor. Obviously, I'm not going to retire yet. Bring it with you. He is my oh, successor. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to let Mike take it from here. And then if anybody has questions, please type it up. As you know, this is a very casual meeting. Ask any questions you may have. So take yeah. it. Later, Mike, before you get going, I want to... Julian, if you don't mind, go back to what we were talking about. Um, we had a period of time in this industry where everyone was doing free insurance, and you stuck to your knitting and uh, never got involved with any of the crazy stuff that went on in our industry. A lot of people came and went. Um, if you want to take a second and just talk about, you know, even those dog days a little bit for you guys and, and how you stayed inside, you know, your guardrails. Well, there's one thing I believe in, Barry. Uh, it's, it's staying in my box. You do one thing and just be good at it. And I remember in the mid 2000s, we had all the IOLI story, free insurance and all that stuff. And one thing we did at Succession Capital, and for everyone's benefit, when Succession Capital started in 03, 04, it was a joint venture between us and a Fortune 20 company. And that company was AIG Corp, not on the life side, but on the corporate side. And then of course we took, we bought we took over the company in 2010 when AIG had their crisis. But again, we did not jump in the bandwagon of the free insurance and all the scams that was going on in the industry. Today, the reason nationwide John Hancock is in the process and other carriers, Pacific Life, they all have premium finance brochures for their clients, all right, and their advisors, and it's all co-branded. And the reason it's co-branded because again, Barry, we stay in our box, we doing it right, we service our clients, no scams. So 
bottom line is our persistency with all the carriers, it's over 99%. And we're very proud of that. Yeah, I think those Phil Brandon brochures, Barry and, and Julian mentioned, John Haycock should be out in the next couple of weeks with our co-branded with Succession Capital. There is no better, uh, I think, tool to send to a client or a center of influence to say, my partner on this premium financing case is actually endorsed by the insurance carriers themselves. Um, and like Julian said, and like you were talking about, it's our history, it's doing things the right way for 26 years is why we get that kind of respect. It also matters on the lending side as well, but I think it's a huge competitive advantage to us and something that we're, we're very proud of. Um, through the course of the, of the conversation today, we did want to share a couple of examples, Barry, that maybe everyone on the phone wouldn't normally think of for premium financing that we thought were good opportunities. Specifically, we wanted to talk about kind of generally what we call the 1035 alternative. There's so much business out there on it, uh, sort of leveraging off of enforced business, but 1035s have become more difficult over the years. And we've developed strategies as an alternative to 1035s, and we haven't done a 1035 Julian in, in years. I mean, we maybe do one a year at best. So what we want to show you today is how you can take existing policies in different capacities and how we've used them on real cases that we've closed over the last six months to leverage them into larger sales. So we did want to share at least two case examples, but we thought we'd start with a little bit of detail, one about how we work and kind of the, the, the value add that we bring and what our role is in the process. We did want to talk a little bit about our lenders and our loan programs, because that is a huge competitive advantage that we bring to the table. And then through those case examples, you'll get a better sense of how we design cases as well. And as you mentioned, Barry, this is pretty informal. So if you have a question, just go ahead and type it in and we'll make sure we get to it as we go through. Okay, so yeah, and I want to make sure everybody mutes um, as well. Uh, that'd be helpful. Um, so in order to start the process, we thought it'd be helpful to, to kind of gauge where our, our value add and our partnership comes because when we work with an advisor, we look at them as a partner, not just a one-off uh, premium financing case. And when I say a partner is we want to uh, work with advisors that want to make premium financing a part of their practice on a regular basis, do one or two or three cases a year. And that's really where we can, we can add value. And in order to kind of understand where we fit in this process, I think it's important to break down what it takes to do a premium financing case. Because we talked about 172 cases, and there might be people on the phone that did 172 non-finance cases, and that's a lot of work in and of itself. But 172 financing cases. Uh, no, I'm good. This is an Bubble water? I'm not going to mute everybody here, Barry. I don't know if you have the ability to do that. Hold on. If I can do that. Uh, I'll have one, too, please. I think I agree again. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Barry, do you have any way to do that on your end? I don't know. If I've got it. Sean, do you have it on yours to do a, a master? I think the host needs to do it. Uh, Barry, maybe shoot Padria a text if she's not listening. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, I'll do that. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. So, uh, so to come back to this, when it, when it comes to um, a, a partnership, getting 172 premium financing cases is extraordinarily difficult. Now, we're partnering with another advisor, so we're not I doing a couple of dollars. Um, but, I, but I think the key to it is these are really hard cases to get to the finish line. With that in mind, to close a large case without financing is also very difficult. So what we have up here on the screen is what I would call a checklist of what it takes in order to close a large life insurance case without finance. And, and some of the things I wanted to highlight in there are carrier relationships. All of you on the phone, I'm sure, have been in the business a long time if you're, if you're successful in the high net worth space. And you have to leverage off of your own carrier relationships, the carrier relationships that, that BGA has. And as you know, and Julian always likes to use the phrase, it's, it's, it's more about who you know than what you know in this large uh, case market. If you don't have the ability to get exceptions made and understand the process and do it in the, do it right, it's never going to get done. So a lot of the things that you see on the screen there uh, are, are from experience, but they're also from relationships. And those relationships get built over time based on your performance with the carriers in order to get things done. And so a lot of advisors say to themselves, look, I know how to close a large life insurance case. I've done that my whole career. What's so hard about adding financing? All I need to do is go to a bank and get a loan. 
But the reality is when you look at what it takes to be successful on a premium financing case, all of these things come into play. And a lot of these take time and relationships to, to, to build. For example, when it comes to lender relationships and the competitive advantage on uh, loan rates and terms, if we're going to talk about, you're not going to get that unless you have billions and billions of dollars of loans, which we have. So when we go to a lender and we say, look, we have you know, a five to six billion dollar loan portfolio and four to five hundred million in new premiums a year, we want to get loans from you in terms from you that you're not giving to anybody else. We get their attention. Well, if you go there with your one or two cases, you're not going to have that kind of leverage. So by working with us, one of the things that you get is you get to leverage off of our competitive advantage, you know, similar to what you get from a BGA, but on the, on the loan side as well. And that's incredibly uh, important. The other key I wanted to make is just on why it's so important. When it comes to loan structure and loan details, again, unless you've done hundreds and hundreds of these cases, it's almost impossible to really understand this on a deep level. When you're, when you're talking about the policy structure for a high net worth you know, sale, most of you on the phone are either CLU, CFP, or you've just been in the business a long time. You understand how to coordinate this with a trust and, and how the ownership works and, and how gifting works. But when it comes to loans, it is incredibly complex. And especially when you have multiple policies, multiple ownerships, um, the way that the client's financials are structured, if you don't understand how this works, you'll never get the deal done and you're going to look incompetent in the process. So when you are working with Succession Capital, why you're hiring us, why you're working with us and why you're partnering with us is, again, you want to make this a regular part of your practice. You want to do more and more cases. And so what you're essentially doing is you're bringing in the specialist with the relationships in place. We are there to walk you through all aspects of the process. We're here to support you from a sales process. Either myself or Julian will be on all the calls with the client and the client's uh, uh, advisors to make sure it gets communicated properly. You're going to get all of our lender relationships, all of our carrier relationships. You know, obviously BJ is going to do the underwriting, but you, when we're on the app, it gets treated differently from a premium financing perspective. And then I think the other key, which I think Barry, a lot of people miss, and it's probably one of, if not the number one reason, then the number two reason why we get the co-branding from the carriers is that we service the business. You talked about how all the people come in and out of this business, and that's there's nobody around you know, uh, that, that's currently doing it today. And so for us to be able to prove that for 26 years we have been servicing this business is a huge part of it. And if you start to get successful in premium financing without someone like us to back you up, the service work in and of itself is going to take away from you doing more business. Um, one last point on this, Barry. We have tracked this now. And of course, we have a long uh, runway here. But about 20% of our business is from existing clients. So sometimes people look at servicing as just a kind of necessary evil, but we have a process that we put in place where we look for opportunities <coughs> on renewals. Like for example, um, just one of the examples that we, that we have our, our renewal team look for is when collateral is no longer needed on a case, when uh, they just had a huge <laughs> in their buckets, when their net worth has gone up dramatically. Remember, we have to get their... Um, financial basis. And so I'll get uh, a note from our uh, renewal team that says, hey, the client's net worth went up by 15, 20 million. They don't need any more collateral based on the credits they just got. It's the perfect opportunity to now go back to you as the advisor, as our partner and say, here's what we've identified. And now we can go back to the client and sell them a new policy. And about 20% of, like I said, our business is from going back to clients and selling them more. And so there's many things that we bring to the table. And I think if you really want to do this the right way, that's really where we come into play. Now, we use our financing strategy in virtually any life insurance sale, from business planning to income planning to estate planning. Accumulation um, and, sales. And, and accumulation sales. And so we're going to talk about two uh, examples today. The second one's going to be the income sale. But the first one is going to be kind of what I call the 1035 alternative. And we see so much of this business, it's unbelievable. And so uh, for those of you out there, it could be cases you've sold in the past. It could be clients that bought the policies from other advisors, or it's a great segue to bring to uh, centers of influence on how to do business with you because they have clients in their book of business that are ready made for this. Now, um, this was a client. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I get into that, we didn't want to talk about our loan programs. I'm sorry. 
So this is a, a very simple list of what we bring to the table on the lending side. And I can't stress enough how a competitive advantage in the, in the loan space makes a, just an unbelievable difference. We win cases sometimes that we happen to be in competition because we can do loans that nobody else can get done. Well, Mike, let me give Barry and the team a good, a good example. Barry, last, last year in November, oh, no problem. this advisor contacted us. Well, thank you. This case was, this case was approved uh, by John Hancock, but the client shut it down because the agent brought in someone for premium financing and the client was a very sophisticated client. He shut the case down because he didn't like the terms of the loan. Make the story short, all right, we, we, another group contacted us on the same case, all right? Obviously, we like to look at the client. We had that system that Mike will go through this later on. It's called the analyzer. When we discovered the client, the net worth and all that, we came in and we told the client what we can deliver. And actually, Barry, this case, the target premium on it was $2.1 million. We got it done in December. The client paid two month premiums to John Hancock just to ban the coverage. And now we're in the process to finalize the financing on it. And the reason we won this case because of this specific program that we have, which is a 10 year note, and that has a cap with no fees and no prepayment penalties. However, this loan is not for everyone and we don't mass market it, but that gives us a huge advantage today when we're competing on large cases. Take yeah, time. for example, uh, we were using that particular loan program on a call uh, yesterday, and the client has a significant amount of money at JP Morgan. And so sometimes you think, okay, well, JP Morgan could do the loan for one of their clients. So I said to them, um, well, if you wanted to buy that same cap that Julian's talking about, that has no cost on the loan that we're referring to, it would cost you about 5% of your 10 year loan, which was uh, the loan was about $38 million over 10 years. So that's about a $2 million fee to get the same cap. So essentially, Barry, we're bringing $2 million of value to this client that JP Morgan couldn't even give them, who's managing you know, tens of millions of dollars for them. So when you bring that to the table, I mean, the competitive advantage is just so off the charts. And so we have those unique loan programs from the kind of lenders that everybody knows. We also get below street level with all of them for the reasons that I said, we're going to those lenders and we're saying, yeah, you know, you can, you're doing business with, with whoever bring, comes through the door, right? But those people aren't bringing you billions of dollars of loans. And so they have to give us better rates than everybody else because we're their biggest client. All right, Mike, if you, you, you and Julian go back. Uh, Julian, you said you got your client in December. You and I discussed this before, but you got two premium payments. Uh, you want to explain that a little bit? Yeah. So what we did, because the guy took the exams, Barry, and all that, we wanted to make sure we didn't want to lose the offer on that client. So back in December, the client paid John Hancock two-month premiums all right, to put the policy in force, right? While the policy is in force, we're doing the credit underwriting because the loan amount such a big loan, it might take more than two, three weeks and I wanted to play it very safe. So the policy is in force. Once the lender, once we pay the premiums to John Hancock, the client gets his deposits refunded back to him, Barry. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And that's pretty common in what we do, Barry, to get the policy enforced, we don't lose the coverage. And I did want to quickly comment on this. For anybody on the phone that has worked in the premium financing space in the last couple of years, Julian, I think it's fair to say that some lenders are telling them six to eight months to get loans done. Oh, yeah. Well, especially in the last quarter of the year, they were all backed up. And because of COVID, a lot of the lenders, they were understaffed and so forth. So... That's one of the reasons, Barry, we had such a huge year because obviously our business goes on the front line. I'm not being cocky. I'm just telling you the facts. We go on the front line and we they get our cases done. Now, I'm not saying the cases are getting done in a week or two, but instead of taking five months, ours were taking like one month. And I think that's a huge deal, Barry, because everyone on the phone here knows very clearly when you're in sales, 
you don't want one extra day to have to go by because things can change. So uh, another huge competitive advantage, not just the rates and the loan programs, but also the, uh, the fact that we go to the front of the line and we can cut the times to get this done by, like Julian said, three to four months legitimately, if not more. Okay, so with, with that in mind, we're talking about this idea of, of the 1035 alternative. So there's so many reasons to look at what we're about to talk to you about, and there's so many types of cases. Now, this was a particular case where the client had a large enforced whole life policy going in an island. It doesn't matter, I wanna specify whether it's a whole life index, variable, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's in an islet, owned personally, in a LLC. I'm just you know, giving you the specific case profile of a case we closed recently. Um, but you do want a large enforced policy of some kind, okay? This happened to be whole life. And quite frankly, in a lot of ways, whole life's are the best pro, uh, policies to leverage off of. The client was gifting premiums into the islet to pay for these whole life premiums. Now, of course, one of, the, one of the big reasons why it's a perfect time to, to bring up this concept is dividends, as you know, across the board have come down. In the same way, um, uh, index universal life or, or fixed universal life policies, all the crediting rates have come down, at least we can illustrate on index and certainly the fixed income or fixed crediting rates on fixed UL as well. So the client's policy is not necessarily performing as they would like. Doesn't mean that we're gonna get rid of it, but it's a great opportunity to talk to them because normally they have premiums due that either they didn't think they were going to have due or the policy is not performing as they thought. Um, and most of our clients in the high net worth space, Barry, have seen a significant increase in net worth. So this client needed a lot more life insurance anyway. But at the same time, you don't have necessarily a lot more gifting that you can make. So he didn't have the ability to even put much more money into the trust. His uh, net worth had grown substantially. He needed more insurance, didn't want to put more money in necessarily, didn't really have the gifting ability to put more money in. And so you have the backdrop of a, a bit of an underperforming policy, kind of a cap on premiums. And look, could you do a 1035? Yes, it wouldn't add much value. Um, so we came up with what we think is such a, a, a superior strategy. And why whole life is a good product to <laughs> drop of is there's some inherent inefficiency inside a whole life, which I'll talk about a little bit more that you can show the client right off the bat. Now, this particular client ran one of the largest hedge funds in the country. You see, so you can't get smart. This guy was like number one in his class at one of the most uh, prestigious MBA programs in the, in the world. I mean, this guy is, you know, uh, as smart as they come. And he got these concepts so clearly and understood it so clearly. And if, and if he gets it and, it and it speaks to him, it'll speak to any client. So um, conceptually, what we're saying is this. Right now, you have a client putting money into the island. Again, it doesn't matter if it's an island or not per se. In this particular case, he was putting money into the island. And by the way, it doesn't even matter if premiums are due. There happen to be premiums due on this case. But again, in this case, the client was gifting premiums to the island. What we're first going to do is we're going to have the lender loan those enforced premiums. To be specific, it was Northwestern Mutual. Going to loan the Northwestern Mutual premiums to the island. So the client no longer has to write those checks. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take that enforced policy as cash value, uh, cash value as collateral. Um, that policy happened to have a lot of cash in it, eight or nine million. We sometimes have cases where there's a million dollars, 500,000. I think if you have at least half a million dollars of collateral, this concept can really work or cash value. The lender is going to take that Northwestern mutual policy as collateral. They're then going to have the grantor gift the yes. same premiums for the Northwestern policy into the trust, but the trust now doesn't need that money to pay to Northwestern because my lender's paying it. So they only have to pay the interest on that, which is a very low number. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to loan them a ton more premium to pay for these new policies. And those new policies are going to have interest and that money that's coming into the islet is now going to be paying interest, not premium. And because now I have the existing Northwestern plus a hundred million of new index universal life, I combine the two, I'm getting about 150 million of insurance for the same price that he was paying or same out of pocket he was paying for 50 million. No collateral needed. And Julian, I think it's important to say too, we were able to make this without a personal guarantee from the client. So the client had no recourse on this loan whatsoever. It was strictly made to the islet. And I will tell you on this case, Barry, that was a huge point because uh, his attorney wanted to make sure there was 100% that 
no tie back to the client, we were able to accomplish that for him. So again, there's a lot of factors, as I mentioned earlier, in getting these cases done, the loan rate, but also the loan structure and very specific details on the loans that if you don't get done right or don't have the ability to negotiate them properly, it can, can really cause issues. Okay, so when I talked about the enforced policy and why I love enforced whole life, is the client had $8 million of, of cash value and $48 million of death benefit. Now, again, I, I want to reiterate, if you have $500,000 of cash value, this still works. So, you know, don't get scared off by the $8 million. And conceptually, though, this all works the same. The client, what I, the first thing I said to him was, you're going to spend $4 million of premiums over the next 20 years. Your cash value is going to grow from $7.8 million to $27 million. That's almost a four times increase in cash value, right? At the same time, you're buying this primarily for death benefit, and the death benefit's only going up by actually less than you paid. You spent $4.2 million, and because of the lower dividend and because he wasn't paying the full premium, which a lot of clients aren't doing, the actual death benefit wasn't even increasing by 4.1 million. It was increasing by like by 3.6. So for 4.2 million, you're not even getting those premiums covered by the increased death benefit. So essentially you have almost a 0% increase in the dividend. And so what I said to the client is, yeah, it's great that the cash value is growing at such a high clip, but when you die, you don't get the 26, 920 plus the 52, you get the 52. So that really does nothing for you. And you, it's, we call it, in this term, by the way, Barry, I'm going to give this to everyone for their benefit, really speaks to clients because they specifically use this back to me in the second or third meeting. And they said they love this idea. We call it a dead asset. That cash value is a dead asset because it's going to die with the client and have no value to the client. And I think that's a really thing, important thing to communicate. And it really speaks to clients. Again, guy who's number one in his class from the MBA program and you know, runs the largest hedge fund, he gets that in two seconds. So what we're saying to the client, Barry, is now one way to use leverage is a 1035. You can 1035 to 7.8 million. And yeah, you might be able to leverage that up to 75, 80 million of insurance, maybe. Um, but there's a much better way to do this, which is to keep the Northwestern, use it as collateral. What I said to the client is, even though that's a dead asset, while you're alive, that's a really, really valuable piece of collateral. Any bank in the country would love to take Northwestern Mutual paper as collateral and a, a cash value that's growing, you know, at such a significant clip from 7.8 million to 26 million. So what we were able to do, as I said, was loan enough premium to add a uh, hundred million of debt benefits. So if you look, paying exactly the same that they're paying now, 4.1 million. Yeah, Mike, go a little slow on this page so everybody. We'll get it. So here's our current enforce. They're paying 4.1 million of premium for 50 million of death benefit. And if we go out 30 years, which is roughly their life expectancy, it was going to grow to 60. By doing what we're suggesting, paying the same 4 million towards interest, not towards premium, in 30 years, they'd have 170 million of death benefit. So $110 million increase paying exactly the same. And by the way, the net cash value is also more than doubled as well. So the, the cash value is higher. You know, it's one thing if we're going to, you know, kind of lose the cash value in return, we're not. So we're getting high, much higher cash values, almost triple the death benefit in paying exactly the same. Now, we did also tell the client that if they wanted to pay more or they had the ability to give more and pay down the loan or pay more towards interest or whatever they wanted to do, they had the ability to do that. But when the client saw this page, it was... I mean, I hate to use the word no brainer, but realistically it was kind of a no brainer. I have this asset. I'm not personally <clears throat> liable for the loan. The lender is willing to make this loan inside of the trust and I can almost triple my debt benefit paying exactly what I'm already committed to paying. Did you want to Mike, say something? Mike, why are you trying to push up the cash value also? It's not a question of wanting to, it's a question of, um, we, we believe very strongly in using cash value products, right? Index Universal Life products. Um, and we do do whole life products as well, but we want to use cash value oriented products. And because we're, we want to overfund these policies, Barry, with lots of cash so that we have plenty of collateral to give the client flexibility. Why does the client want flexibility? Because down the road, if they want to skip an interest payment, not pay the interest, if they want to pay down the loan, if they want to, you know, potentially even use some of that cash for other purposes, I don't want them to come back to me, Gary, uh, Barry, and say to me, 
yeah, it's great, Mike. You got me 110,000 million more debt benefit, but I have no cash. And if I need it, I can't get it. Or if the policy doesn't perform and I need to post more collateral, or if I can't pay the interest, I don't have any options. So it's not the focus or the uh, primary goal, but we always want as much cash value as we can get it, assuming that it's not going to cost the client sort of more money, obviously, because at the end of the day, that gives them significantly more flexibility and manages the risk much more effectively. Let me add one more thing there. This is really important. And I've been saying this for over 20 years, and I'm sure you've heard me say this. We want to make sure also create safety nets for the clients. For whatever reason, if the client says after, doesn't matter, 10 years, 12 years, 5 years, 20 years, if he wants exit, he says, I don't need these policies anymore. Hell with the taxes, blah, blah, blah. I want to exit. We want to make sure the client doesn't owe the bank $20, $30 million. We want to make sure he's got enough safety nets if he exits, he doesn't have to write a check. Does that make sense, Perry? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So I think for this, uh, whoops, sorry about that. For this, uh, for the, for this case or, or case facts, what you want to look for uh, in your book of business or from centers of influence is clients with large enforced cash values. I'd say over 500,000 is a good start. Um, again, IUL, VUL, fixed UL, whole life, doesn't really matter what the enforce is. One other benefit, and I always like to bring this up here, is you know, if you do a 1035 exchange, and especially if you didn't sell the policy, the other agent's going to be alerted and you've sort of invited in the competition, right? And they're going to be able to at least make some valid points. Even that Northwestern agent is going to say, look, the cash value is growing, you're giving that up. You know, uh, you've already paid the acquisition costs. You bought this when you were much younger. So you avoid all of that when you don't 1035 because you're actually keeping the policy. So that's one advantage. And if you happen to sell the policy, I always think it never looks good to go back to a client and replace your own policy if you don't have to. So for all those reasons, I think it's, it's a great way to go back to all these clients, whether you sold it or not, and, and use a concept. Now, this is highly customized, so it's not going to look exactly like we just showed you, but we have a way to um, almost in all cases develop a sale. Typically, you want clients for this type of planning, probably for net worth above 15 million. There's some wiggle room there. Maybe we can do it for a nine or $10 million net worth, primarily over 15. Um, if they're owned in the trust, that's great. But if the policies are owned in the estate, it's even better. So we had a case earlier this year where a client had a similar policy size, but it was in the estate. Now, you might think that's crazy, but how many clients started buying? And the death benefit wasn't as big. The cash value wasn't as big. How many clients bought policies for an investment purpose from Northwestern, Mass Mutual, these whole life specialty carriers, and thought they would just have it as like a bond alternative, which is what this client did. Now the guy's worth $400 million and he's got $10 million of cash in his estate. Incredibly inefficient, right? But if you have to gift that to a trust, you know, you're using $10 million of your gift to gift cash. It's not a very efficient gift either. So what we were able to do in that case is very similar to what I just showed you. But instead of the policy being in the trust, it was owned personally. So he just posted that policy as collateral and we bought the insurance in the trust and used this policy as collateral to pay for it. No gift and also no personal guarantee on that deal either. Um, he just posted his personal policy. So no risk to him other than that uh, enforced policy. So it's actually even better for clients that own the policy in their estate because we're showing them, a, a, we're solving the even bigger problem is how do I get this policy out without a gift? And so that's a huge opportunity as well. And it's a really good thing to bring up when you're talking to uh, centers of influence. Okay, um, next case that we want to talk about. And I assume Barry, everyone on the, on the call has LERP designs or life insurance retirement planning or asset accumulation designs. I mean, there's different terminology in our industry that they've sold over the years, non-financed. And it could be financed too, but I assume non-financed is pretty popular. Where, is that fair statement, Barry? A lot of agents, advisors you work with have sold these. Yes. Yep. This is your perfect profile. It's going back to those clients and improving their situation. So this was a particular case where the client had a large enforced IUL. They bought it for tax-free income. They were paying premiums on the max non-MEC basis. They had substantial cash value already accumulated. And it performed well, they loved the idea, um, and they wanted as much tax-free income as they can get. They didn't necessarily want to put in more money, um, but possibly if there was a value there. Um, so what we were able to do on this client, who was 51, 
is we said, look, you're already putting in a million two and you're going to get out six and a half million of tax free income. We're going to loan you that million two premium. Plus, we're going to loan you a bunch more premium to get an even bigger policy and add it to it. It was about a $500,000 target on the new case. We were able to use the enforced policy as collateral, so no additional collateral, loan the premiums, and the interest cost over time was double, uh, 2.4 million versus 1.2 million. But we quadrupled their income. So if you look at six and a half million to 25 million, that's four times, a little over, uh, very close to four times income for paying only 1.2 million more, you got 18 million of income. These sales are so simple because you're going back to a client who's already committed money, don't need any collateral. And we could also design these very where they don't put in more money. I can, you know, those are all things that we can talk about offline with anybody who has a case. But it's such a huge opportunity because you've already sold the client. They already have seen the policy perform. They're a believer in the concept and you're now just leveraging it up to make it an even better result. And even with AG49A limitations, these are the kind of results we're seeing because leverage adds that much value to what we're bringing to the table. And Barry, let me add something else here. This is really important. Again, uh, some of the guidelines that the carriers are publishing out there today with limits of premiums and all that. Uh, obviously, if I have a client that wants to, we're going to lend them $4 million a year for the next five years or six years, uh, I'm going to get the approval done on that. So. Those guidelines, again, that doesn't apply. Some of these guidelines don't apply to us. I just want to make sure you were aware of that. So go ahead, Mike, what's the question? Yeah, we had one question before we continue. Um, uh, someone asked the question, do you have programs on use or views on using finance and a MEC policy, especially for older ages? So we do finance MEC policies on older ages. Um, in many cases, it actually looks good. Uh, there's a lot of complexity and details that we'd have to talk about offline around that. But for younger clients, it certainly doesn't make sense. But for older ages, it, it can make sense. One, because I think it gives more exit strategies. And two, it potentially gives you um, uh, a more cost-effective way to, uh, to pay for the policy than, than paying the, the non-MEC premium over time. The way the MEC rules work, as you get to older ages, the the allowable increase in premiums doesn't necessarily correlate properly to the increased cost. So non-MEC policies, especially with the lower AG 49A, don't quite look as good. So actually, yes. let me add something else here, Mike. Actually, Adam, the question, it, it is a very good question. For the older ages, we've done a lot of MEC financing, all right? However, because the client's life expectancy, let's say it's short, let's say the guy's 76 or 78 years old, the life expectancy is short. So the client is just paying level interest payments. So sometimes it really works well. However, keep in mind, if the client unwinds the policy or surrenders, he will have tax liability there, just to make sure you understand that. Right. All right, go ahead. Okay, so for the sake of time, just because, um, we have uh, maybe about 15 minutes, but we wanted to leave five or 10 minutes for questions, Barry. Is, um, so I wanted to go over a little bit about how to engage with us, if you have a case. Um, when it comes to these sort of in-force um, LERP cases, I think when you have clients that have about 250,000 or more of cash value, net worth of 5 million, we're a little more flexible in the net worth when you talk about uh, tax-free income designs. Um, clients that are focused on tax-free income, and I say clients that either have 250 of cash and are paying 100,000 of premium. Um, if they don't have 250,000 of cash, I think you'd want them to pay at least 100 to 200,000 of premium. That's still potentially a good prospect as well. Because remember, we're going to loan them the premium that they're paying now, loan them the premium for a bigger policy, and use the 100 or 200,000 that they're paying towards interest in order to get a better result. Now, with that being said, I did want to talk about how to engage with us, and this is important. Mike, one question I see, <clears throat> they're asking about foreign nationals. Okay. All right, for foreign nationals, let's say we have clients, if let's say they're from China or they're from Hong Kong, as long as they can create a trust in the US or an LLC, we can lend that trust, the print. Obviously, they have to put some assets in the trust, 
all right? We will have the trust be the borrower and the owner of the policy. And as long as the clients have the financials to pledge the collateral and all that, we've done foreign nationals here. And again, assuming you have the right carrier also, because we will not be able to lend carriers that be that they have, <clears throat> excuse me, B rated, they need to be A plus rated carriers or A at least. All right. I hope I answered that question. Go ahead. Did you want me to cover this one? You want me to cover this? Go ahead. One? Okay. So th there's another question about programs under five million. Well, almost every carrier is cracking down pretty heavily on this. Even the carriers that are at five million now are all raising their limits. Um, most of them already have. So I think the other under five million dollar market is kind of dying in the premium financing space. The fair statement, Julian. Yes. Yes. Now, are there exceptions? Yes. I always use a, an easy example would be like an NFL player, an NBA player, something like that. If maybe they're worth three or four million, but they have a $45 million guarantee contract. Okay, that might be an exception to where you can get it done. But generally, um, that's not really a space we like to play in, Julian. We like to be, we have clients that are solid financially and we're not going to have any issues down the road. So we don't really play in that space. We certainly don't like to, to, to play in any of these, like you said, trust structures that are grouped. Uh, combined because one, the carriers don't approve them all, hardly at all. Number two, we feel like uh, it puts the client in a really bad position. And three, if you're paying out the premium and borrowing out the premium, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of leverage. And I think four, um, when it comes to the to the under five million dollar market, um, it, it's typically financing is not the right avenue for them. Quite frankly, it's just they're just not wealthy enough to do it. So, however, let me just add this. Let's assume you have a client that's net worth is $10 million and you want to do that Kaizen model. Keep in mind, we can do that all day long for the client that has the right net worth and income. Because again, one thing I will mention, and I'm not uh, bashing uh, the guys in Texas with the Kaizen plan. They don't have the, I don't believe they can renew these notes after 14, 15 years. All right, so when it comes to 14 years from now, the, I'm not sure if they'll be able to renew those loans. Because keep in mind, the market's gonna have ups and downs. There is no way you're gonna be able to earn 6% straight for the next six years. I mean, 15 years, number one. Number two, we don't e you don't even know what the rate's gonna be, borrowing rates, I'm talking about 12 years from now, 11 years from now. However, if you have the client with the right net worth and income, we can match that model all day long. Yeah. And one last point on this. Um, we're in a business where we have to obviously be smart about what we do. And uh, like Barry talked about 180 cases, you can't do 400 cases in a year. And so we want to be selective and do cases that have the most impact and also are the most uh, profitable. And quite frankly, doing cases in the under 5 million market is not really a great market to be in. And you have to do a lot of volume. And the, the benefit to the client is not as high for all the reasons that we're saying. So anyway, with that being said, it's not really something we focus on. Now, when it comes to premium financing, our onboarding uh, tool, we have a very specific fact finder that we created. And I wanted to give everybody just a quick background on where we came up with this. So in doing this for 26 years, we looked at all the cases that we've closed. And we said, well, what is the real key to a premium financing case closing, right? And if you look at it, in relation to like a custom home, like you see here on the, on the screen. It's the foundation that is the most important. If you wanna build you know, a $25 million home in Julian's neighborhood in Pelican Crest, uh, you, know, you can spend a lot of time picking the flooring, the, the pipes, the you know, layout, but if you don't build on a solid foundation, it's not gonna last, right? It's worthless. And so with premium financing, it's no different. You gotta do the medical underwriting, the credit underwriting, you gotta present and get the client to, to buy in all the things that you see in the house there. But if you don't have a solid foundation that, that at some point that the thing's going to fall apart. So for us, what we realize that that solid foundation comes from three sort of avenues. The first is what I call your relationship. There has to be a strong relationship in this sales process, whether it's you and the client, whether it's you and their center of influence or some combination of those things. We have found that out of those cases that we do every year, the relationship is really, really high on virtually every case. Is that fair, Julian? Yep, yep. Okay. Number two is that the client believes and understands the need for owning life insurance, and they're not just looking at buying life insurance because there's financing. 
financing makes insurance much more uh, beneficial and powerful and, and, and more, uh, I guess, palatable for them to pay and, and to implement. But if the only reason they're buying it is for free insurance or some of the things that Barry was talking about at the beginning, it's going to fall apart because there's not enough need and value. So we still have to communicate why is this client buying the insurance? What's the value? Where does it fit in? And then the final thing is financials, which is what that last question was about. They have to have good financials. That's just kind of a non-starter if they don't. Under 5 million, especially in today's world, I mean, we're in California, so we're slightly jaded, but 5 million in California is, I would say, not considered wealthy, right? And so this is for high net worth clients that really should be doing this. And so when you're at 5 million, I mean, a lot of people's houses would you know, account for half of that net worth, right? So 5 million net worth is really, really low. So we're looking at clients that have really solid financials. Now, that being said, why all three of those matter is what would I rather have? Would I rather have a client worth 100 million with great financials, but doesn't believe in life insurance and doesn't have a good relationship with you? Would I rather have a client worth 20 million with a, a real belief in life insurance and a great relationship? To me, there's you've got to factor in all of these three things together. So we've created a tool to do that which we call our client prospect analyzer. All of you will get this email to you. It's also on our website. Um, you fill it out and it immediately goes into our system. We immediately start to run numbers and start the process. Um, it asks questions that you would need on any fact finder, but it also asks questions uh, around what I call those other relationship and need. So for example, does your client have an identifiable need for life insurance? Yes, they've established it, or their CPA or attorneys established it, or no, there is no need been established. That's a bad answer. That means this case has some issues that we have to look at. Um, another question that we ask here is, does your client own life insurance for greater than $5 million? If they don't own any life insurance, that's not a good client because clearly they don't believe in life insurance if they haven't bought it to this point. doesn't mean we can't sell them, but we're trying to gauge how good of a prospect is this. And so this is a tool, and at the end, we score it and tell you how solid the, the case is. And, and really quickly on relationship, have you sold your client any life insurance policy in the past? If the answer is no, I've never sold them any financial products, think very you'd agree. That case is going to be difficult to sell because if the first thing you're trying to sell them is a multi-million dollar life insurance policy, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a big hill to climb. So we want to know all of those things going into a case. And it immediately, as I said, gives you a score up to 100 on how good the case is. It gives us a template in order to get the case closed. Now, I can get a case closed if the, if the score is relatively low. We can overcome some of these things, but we want to know up front what we're working with so we can give us the best chance of getting it to the finish line. So with that in mind, we'll, we'll spend the rest of the, of the time we have on some questions. Um, one more we had one question here, Barry, and then... Um, if you wanted to open it up to anybody else. Okay, so Sean has this question, what is a 10 year fixed rate? Right now, if we want a 10 year fixed, keep in mind, Sean, when banks offer a fixed rate, they're always gonna ask, you're gonna have to pledge a prepayment penalty uh, on a fixed rate. On our loans, assuming the client have the right financials and no red flags on his credit report, our 10 year fixed right now, it's 2.875 fixed for 10 years with no prepayment penalty. So keep in mind, the client doesn't have to pledge no prepayment penalties on this, on our fixed rates. So in our opinion, that's the most best fixed rate in the industry. Yeah, I want to comment on that, Sean, what he's saying, why that's so important. You might say, okay, great. Who cares about a prepayment penalty if the client's not going to break it? But you still have to collateralize that prepayment penalty. So if, that, pre so if that prepayment penalty is half a million dollars, a million dollars, you have to now collateralize that. And you're not going to get a better rate anyway having to collateralize that. So that is hands down what we can offer on the, on the fixed rate side is second to none. Nobody can touch that. However, Sean, I will tell you, again, I present you know, dozens and dozens of cases every year when a client asks for a fixed rate, I'll tell them, I have a better arrangement than a fixed rate for you for 10 years. How about if I start you, instead you're paying 2.8%, you pay 2%, all right? Worst case scenario, your rate would never go above 3.25 over 10 years, all right? The client says, wait a minute, is there a fee on the cap? No, there is no fee on the cap. There is no prepayment penalty at all. So why would you pay 2.8 from starting in year one 
when you can pay 2% for the next couple of years, and worst case scenario, the rate could never go above 3.25. So, but if the client wants a fixed rate for 10 years, if you want to pay a higher rate going in from day one, it's 2.8% right now. Yeah. Anyway, so right, I got a question for you guys. I know the answer to it, but um, someone works with you and you go on the app for a portion of that case. And in return, you get a thorough process that you guys have, carriers have vetted. You stay in touch with the client. You want to just talk about your process a little bit and the protection that you get by working with you guys and, and what the client gets in return? Yeah, and let me, I'll have Mike explain that. But there's one uh, comment I want to make to you, Barry, because it happens quite often over the years. Let's say, Barry, you submit us, you give us a case, and then Sean gives us the same case two days later. One thing you know, Barry, you know by reputation. If you gave me the case first and Sean comes in two days later with the same case, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna tell Sean, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Barry's in, I gotta work with Barry. I'm not gonna mention obviously your name, but first comes, first serve. I wanna make sure you know that we protect the advisors all the time. Yeah, and, and, and that actually is an important point, Barry, because Sometimes people come to us after they try to do something else and they say, hey, I want to bring this case to you and somebody already brought it to us and it's sort of too late. So with that in mind, our process is very simple. You fill out that analyzer. It immediately goes into our system. We run the illustrations. Um, myself or Julian will do a call with the advisor to walk through and make sure we're on the same page and that we agree that this is the design we want to show the client. Then once we uh, agree to the next step, we do a phone call, a, a Zoom, a go to meeting with the client. Uh, where myself or Julian will present to the client along obviously with the advisor. Um, once they move forward, typically you're doing the underwriting. Um, we do the uh, credit underwriting. So our team will reach out and send you everything that you need. We have a whole team of people that will work directly with the advisor and their team to make sure we get it done right. Um, once the case funds, we have a renewal team that will reach out to you 60 days prior to the renewal, tell you everything that's needed in advance. And if things come up on the renewal, we need to you know, negotiate the rate or negotiate a term or we need to refinance the loan or the client wants to add a policy. We handle all of that. Um, it's a big deal. Julian mentioned 2009. Uh, we renewed 100% of the loans. I can't tell you the comfort that advisors feel knowing that they have us backing them up and that if anything changes in the, in, in the, in the future, that it's not going to impact your client. Um, let, me, let me add something, Barry. This is really important for you and your team and the advisors on the phone. All right, when, you, when you're working on a very large cases, and I'm talking about those are targets, million dollar plus, these are sophisticated clients. When I'm on a Zoom meeting with them, or even in person, and let's say we're, we're competing with another group, I'll tell the client, ask this other group, have they been using premium financing before 08? All right, and if they say yes, then you ask them the next question, have they renewed their client's loans? after all in 08 or after 99.9 percent .9 the odds are they were not in business before 08 because as you know there's all these newcomers and number two they did not renew the loans and the reason would be i bring that up with a very the high net worth client they understand you know it's a cycle we will go to another cycle maybe next year maybe two years from now and all that so the key is i tell the high net worth client, we have the staying power, all right? And a lot of these other aggregators, I don't believe they don't. I, they don't have the staying power because they haven't been around that long. Yeah, and, and one last point on this, uh, you know, I definitely would, I hate the term aggregator because I don't think that applies to us in any way. I would not put it in that boat. We are, you know, the best premium financing firm in the country and we are a partner to advisors. So again, those are the kind of relations we look for. We go on the app for 30% uh, is our minimum. Um, depends on the amount of work we do, sometimes more. Like if it's in person or if we need to get more involved in the underwriting. But the majority of the cases would be 30% that we go on the app for. And then the other 70% that you go on, you run it through your BGA um, uh, contract like you normally would. We go on. Well, no, app. our 30% goes to me. Well, they do too, but I'm saying that their portion would get paid whatever they get yeah. paid. Yes, correct. Okay. All right, Barry, any more questions for us? I don't see any. Anyone who open up their mic and ask any questions before we leave? Yeah, we're, we're up on time here, but we have a minute. Well, we got two minutes. 
I have a quick question for you. Sure. Are you, are you generally structuring these with an exit strategy? Or are you leaving the loans in place indefinitely? Well, it depends on the it depends on the client and the and the game plan, and it also depends on their agents. I mean, I have clients right now, Rick, on the books with me for over twenty years. All right, because in the old days, remember, we didn't have any index products, but this client's the way the policies have been designed. Like I have clients right now for with John Hancock, and that's one thing I like about John Hancock, especially with their fixed portfolio. They're still paying four point, I believe, four point three five percent on enforced regular UL policies. There is no other carriers are doing that today. So we have clients that they've been on the books for a long time. All right. And then on that end with the younger clients, yes, we do create exit plans. And I think the exit strategy terminology is pretty big. Um, I know this comes up all the time. I think you always need to have an exit strategy to some degree. And, you know, what, how good it is or not obviously depends on a lot of factors. With that being said, what I will say is we all, almost always show some sort of exit strategy, but all exit strategies are not created equal. So one of the things that you see in our, in the premium financing space, Rick, a lot is people showing exit strategy from the loan by borrowing on an alternate loan or an index loan from the policy, right? Mm -hmm. In reality, that's not really an exit strategy. That's just refinancing the loan. So I just want to be clear when we do show an exit strategy, which we do in almost all cases, we're showing it as a withdrawal to basis or a fixed loan from the policy because that's a true loan repayment. So uh, I just also want to make that point because as you know, there's what we call illustration games that can be played. So when we do show the exit strategy, we want to make sure it's a true exit strategy. So Barry, we appreciate you having us. All right. And again, we look forward for a long-term beneficial relationship together. And if anybody has any questions or if you have any cases, as Mike explained, you're welcome to use our analyzer, send it to us, and then uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Barry. All right. Thank Absolutely. you. Very and your analyzer is on your website. Absolutely. It's on our website. Also, Adrena is going to send it to everybody. But if you go to the advisor to advisor section of our website, the tab, the advisor to advisor section, the client prospect analyzer links right there. All right. Thank you, Jen. We'll do this again. Well done. Absolutely. Thank, thank, thank you, guys. Have a great Take day. Take care. Bye-bye.